is written in, in Fortran, which as I've mentioned, an old, old language. If you'd like to run it in Fortran, there's a free compiler available called G Fortran. I believe it's from the GNU Free Software Project. But I strongly urge you to trans, if you decide you want to play with this code, to translate it into the programming language of your choice. I understand from Christiane that there is a lab here with licenses for MATLAB, so if you don't happen to have a computer with you that runs MATLAB and you want to play around with something in MATLAB, just ask Christiane, you can get access to that for us. Um, and there's also uh, Linux machines available if you'd like to uh, run your code in any other programming language. Um, and I have various other codes I can show you, and I'm happy to share copies of any of these codes you'd like to see. So today we're going to go on and look at uh, some more modeling methodologies, sticking with the theme of the XY model initially. I wanted to mention, besides Monte Carlo simulation, which stochastically samples um, the phase space of configuration and kind of uh, relaxes towards uh, thermal equilibrium, there's another way to simulate the XY model, which is much more mechanical in its viewpoint, which is the XY rotor model. And the idea here, is there, is there a pointer? I don't remember. No, these are all markers. I have what happened now? Oh, the stick. You can like, hit people if they just okay. So, um, in the XY model, there's a, there's a potential energy. That's what we were using before we wrote SI.SJ. You can equally well write that as a cosine, right? That's the potential energy. So to turn this into a mechanical model, we actually now uh, assume that each, each little spin has a moment of inertia, which I'm just going to call by the letter I. And then in my Hamiltonian, I have potential energy and I have kinetic energy. And what's the kinetic energy of a rotating body? One half I omega squared, right? Just like kinetic energy, one half mv squared, but for rotation, maybe you remember freshman physics. Okay, so besides the moment of inertia, each spin has an angular position theta, we know that an angular velocity omega, which is the time derivative of the position, and an angular acceleration, which is the second derivative of angular position with respect to time. Okay, and the equation of motion is torque is I alpha. Okay, and the torque is a generalized force. It's the derivative of the energy with respect to the angular orientation. So as a very simple example, if I have two neighboring spins, call them theta one and theta two. Okay, and we'll call, you know, horizontal is theta zero and theta increases as you go up here. So if the energy has that form, it's just the dot product, right? Then um, the first torque on this one is actually positive. That's the minus the derivative, the u d theta 1, right? So that this, this spin is, has a slightly higher value of theta. Sine theta 2 minus theta 1 is a positive number. Torque spin number 1 has a positive torque, pushing it to increase in theta. And likewise, theta 2 has a negative torque, which is causing it to go back towards zero. So just like in real life, everyone tries to uh, resemble their neighbors, right? We all try to imitate each other. So the same way, each of these spins has a torque that pulls them towards one another. And you'll notice that the torques are equal and opposite. This is a Hamiltonian system. If I set those two spins in motion with initial angular velocity zero, since the torques are equal and opposite, angular momentum will be conserved and the sum of kinetic and potential energy will be conserved as they move. There's no dissipative forces, uh, if there are no dissipative forces. So um, it's a Hamiltonian system. And we can do lots of them, so here's a little simulation. Okay, here I'd just like to know, because of the convenience of my visualization software, each spin is visualized with, it, with its end at the lattice site, rather than being centered on the lattice site. I'm sorry if that's hard to look at. In this case, what I'm doing is I'm gradually sucking energy out of the system to cool it down. It's gone through its phase transition and it's just relaxing to a ground state. Okay, so it's a mechanical version of the XY model. It's not a particularly popular model. I like to play with it. We can also visualize it the other way by grayscale. Here's a slightly larger system because it's, it's inconvenient to look at the arrows for a slightly larger system. I think maybe this is 100 by 100. And again, I'm cooling it off slowly by sucking energy out of the system. And it's going to end up with four topological defects. And just to remind you how that works at the end of the simulation, I rotate the polarizer right and left. Well, numerically, there's no physical polarizer here. And watch those defects. You can see, there they go, right, left, right, left. OK, so it goes plus, minus, plus, minus. Four defects left. Periodic boundary conditions. Periodic boundary conditions. Good call. Let's do that again and watch it again. Looks like static on television screen, right? 
but as it cools off, uh, the defects form. They're not very mobile, they don't diffuse around very much. Actually, not at all. Pyrrhal's barrier is high for the spoilers. By the way, that XY model code that I, that I uh, posted for you uses the square lattice. If you wanted to code it for a triangular lattice where each thin has six neighbors, how would you do that? Do you have any idea? If you're interested, ask me. I'll show you how. It's not that hard. Oh, did it already rotate? Rotate. Okay. So I wanted to actually just, some people gave me positive feedback that actually liked looking at code. If you guys are too sleepy to look at code, let me know. Do you want to look, look at it or do you want to skip it for now? Okay. We'll look at it a little bit? Okay. This is um, slightly small font. Can you see that or do I need to blow it up? You can see it okay? You guys have young eyes. Okay. So um, DT is a time step. This is a time stepping program. We're integrating equations of motion forward in time, rather like molecular dynamics. How many of you have coded molecular dynamics like Leonard Jones two dimensional liquid? Anybody? Oh my goodness, we have no chemists here. Okay. Um, so we need a time step. Uh, the choice of the time step is pretty simple. We want to make the time step as large as possible and still conserve energy to good, good um, precision. Uh, let's see, we need pi. It's not automatically defined in Fortran. So we're, the first thing I'm going to do is set all the angular velocities to zero, all the angles to be random, like every spin has random orientation between zero and two pi. That's not the only initial state we could consider, but it's a simple one. And, um, and, I, and I actually have to store, because of the technique I'm using for integrating equations of motion and forward in time, I need two copies of the torque. So since torque is proportional to angular acceleration, and since I'm taking the moment of inertia equal to unity, torque and angular acceleration are the same. And since I don't write in Greek letters in a Fortran program, I'm using A for alpha and W for omega and TH for theta. Pretty simple, right? Okay, first thing I'm going to do is, uh, let's see, I need to, before I start the main loop of the program, just as in molecular dynamics, I need to do one calculation of the torque for each spin. So what, whereas in Monte Carlo simulation, you pick one spin and you mess with it, then you leave it alone, and you pick another spin and you mess with it, and you, then you leave it alone. By contrast, in this time stepping program, every single spin gets updated at every single time step all together, all, all simultaneously. The first thing I have to do is calculate the torque on each spin. In this case, torque being angular acceleration, they're the same thing. So what I do is I go through the loop. Each spin says, what's the spin to the right of me? I plus one, apply periodic boundary conditions if I plus one is greater than N, then your neighbor to the right is on the other side of the lattice. That's easy. Same for J. So I is tracking across the screen in one direction, J across the other direction. Uh, and then I calculate the, the, the derivative of the potential, right? The potential is the cosine, derivative of the cosine is minus the sine, the torque is the opposite of that, right? Minus the derivative. So the torque between two spins is a sine, and that torque is added positive to one and negative to the other. Okay, now if I have a square lattice and I want to look at all pairs, does each spin have to look north, south, east, and west? No, if I did that, I'd be looking at each pair twice. I only need to look at each pair once. So if each site calculates its torque with the spin to the right and the spin above, that will cover all bonds in the lattice once, right? If you, if you have each spin calculate interaction north, south, east, and west, you'll have doubled your computer time and you may also make a factor of two error in calculating your torque. Okay, so we calculate the torques once. And um, so let's talk about the velocity barely algorithm. Have you heard of that before? Velocity Verle is the simplest, there's many, many ways to integrate differential equations numerically. Um, you can look them up, what do they have names? Predictor corrector, gear, runga kata, what else? Any other ideas? There's just many, many techniques. This is the simplest one and, and so I thought I'd show you something simple. The way the Velocity Verle algorithm works is the first thing you do is you uh, integrate the equation uh, for the spin positions, theta. Okay. And then you store the current version of the torque. You calculate the new torque based on the new positions. Okay. Uh, then you update the angular velocities and repeat. Like it says on the, on the shampoo bottle, wash, rinse, repeat. If you followed the shampoo bottle, you'd still be in the shower. Right? Because you'd still be repeating. Um, anyway, so in this case, what's going to go on? So 
I'm going to do a loop here on 10,000 time steps. Every 100 steps, I give myself a little note what step I'm on so I can follow how fast my code is running. Um, at, the first thing I do is update theta. So if you remember in freshman physics, what's the equation of motion at, for a constant acceleration motion? x equals x naught plus v naught t plus 1 half at squared, something like that. This is the same thing for angular motion. The new value of theta is the old value of theta plus omega times the, the little time step dt. dt2 o2 is a, uh, I said somehow at the beginning is 1 half dt squared. Um, times the acceleration, the angular acceleration. So I integrate, all the little spins rotate a little bit, first thing. Second thing, uh, store the old value of the accelerations, zero out the new copy of the accelerations, uh, calculate them going through nearest neighbor pairs, calculating the sign of interaction between nearest neighbor pairs, calculating. Also here, just for, uh, to check how well en uh, energy is conserved, I calculate potential and kinetic energy. What's the kinetic energy of a rotating body? One half I omega squared, right? And we have potential energy, which is that cosine function, and we can show that their sum is, is well conserved. Um, and also calculate total angular momentum. And in order to, the simplest way to remove energy and cool the system down is at each time step to multiply all the angular velocities by a number less than one. That just slows everything down. Okay, and that sucks energy out of the system and makes it cool. It's also possible to use a thing called a thermostat. Okay, I don't see a thermostat in this room. Do we have a thermostat? There they are, national thermostats. Okay, what does it mean to apply a thermostat to a physics model like, say, molecular dynamics? Does anybody here even use like Bromax or any other kind of molecular simulation? No one here has done any molecular simulation? One person. What's a thermostat? Right, control the temperature of the system. When a body is in thermal equilibrium with a heat bath, it means it can exchange small amounts of energy with the heat bath. It can receive energy from the heat bath or give it back. Let's talk about simulation ensembles. Okay, if you run the system without a thermostat, so that the sum of kinetic and potential energy is conserved, then we're in, in uh, one ensemble. What is that, the microcanonical ensemble when energy is constant? Okay. Or if the system's at, at a given temperature, it means we might visit different energies, right? You might have a higher probability to visit a low energy state and a, a smaller probability to visit a high energy state with Boltzmann statistics. So the question of which uh, simulation ensemble we want to be in is, is a question of what kind of physics we want to do. In this particular case, without a thermostat, the system's in the microcanonical ensemble. If we use a thermostat, we can go to the canonical ensemble and look at thermal fluctuations in the energy. What can you get from the thermal fluctuations of the energy? For instance, a measure of the specific heat. Right? There's all kinds of, of interesting statistical physics to do with these, with these models. Um, in this particular case, though, I didn't put in a thermostat. I just did the lazy, simple thing, which is just suck energy out of the system and let it relax to lower and lower temperature, okay, but without thermal fluctuations, really, and, um, and see what happens. So that's where that particular video came from. Um, also, the, the software for visualizing uh, these pictures that I made for you was called Sim Replay. It's a free download from simreplay.org, and I can show you how to use it if you want. Now, just for fun, I also have with me another piece of technology I wanted to show you. But what's even more fun is it's made out of a polystyric liquid crystal, and it has metastable states, just like we were hearing about this morning. This is called a boogie board. Have you guys seen this? Is anybody flying? How many people are flying through an airport in the United States on your way home? Okay, if you are bored sitting in the airport waiting for your connecting flight, go to the nearest, what is the name of that store? Brookstone. Go to the nearest Brookstone. They sell boogie boards. You can play with them or you can play with mine. The, the boogie board comes in several different models. This is a model where, so if you push this button, it erases, and then you can put it here in the light and you can see. You can draw on it, and then push the button, it erase. So it's just like a whiteboard, right? Draw, erase. The cheapest version of it is, I don't know, 30 or $35. They make nice presents for young children who waste a lot of paper drawing, so they can draw, erase, draw, erase. Uh, this is the slightly more advanced version of the boogie board. I can plug it in. I can 
figure out to the switch in. Let's see. There we go. And then I can plug it in the USB drive here. And if I draw in here, you can see it on there. You like that? Can you guys see that? Is that better than writing on the board? Even better, I can click save and it will save what I drew. And then I can post it to Facebook. Ooh. Maybe, maybe you need some boogie. So the problem with the boogie board is that the software is bad. So you can't actually just fill your screen with it. They want to advertise themselves so they show you like a virtual boogie board on this. And you can't turn it sideways. I mean, I could turn the computer sideways, but that wouldn't, I mean, unless I turn the projector sideways, it's not going to make any difference. So, I'll erase this. So, if I need to write anything. Okay, so, does anybody know how the boogie board works? It's a cholesteric polymer composite, and um, there's no, elect aside from the fact that it's communicating with the computer, like the, the cheap $30 version, it doesn't use any power unless you're erasing. So, the cholesteric can exist in two different microstructures. A simple planar microstructure where the director is simply rotating round and round and round like that from the bottom to the top, defect free. That reflects light. That's the, the green color that you see there. Okay. And then when you blast it with a, a, a brief voltage pulse, it actually goes to a defect rich state called the focal conic state, which scatters light and is black. Okay. So by toggling the system, Using mechanical pressure to go from focal conic to planar, and then using a voltage pulse to go from planar to focal conic, the system achieves the, the, the goal of bi-stability, uh, bi right? It can be stable in one state, stable in the other state, and you only need a little bit of voltage. Um, it is also true that you can use voltage pulses to go from dark to light, as well as light to dark, so you can use this technology for signage. It does not glow in the dark like an iPhone, right? It's not backlit. You only read it in, in passively with ambient light, but um, it has, uh, I think, probably many applications in, say, signage in the grocery store. You go to the grocery store and there's a, a little paper tag on the display that says, today bread costs a dollar or 69 cents, right? Well, tomorrow they might want, might want to uh, put it on sale for a dollar and 35 cents, and some poor soul has the job of coming and taking the old tags off, putting the new tags on, what a drag and a waste of resources. If you just had a little bi-stable display that was attached to the network, it could just put up the prices. Kind of interesting thing. Anyway, uh, let's try to do a little more physics. So I mentioned yesterday, and I should do this real quick video, that instead of using a square lattice or a triangular lattice or a honeycomb lattice, one can use a random mesh instead of, instead of a lattice for, say, an XY model or any other kind of simulation you want to do. And I thought I'd mention some algorithms for generating random mesh. Have you ever heard of random sequential absorption? Okay, let's take one step back. If you want to park your car and there's a long curb, but no one has marked any spaces, that's what you would typically find on a street in the town where I live. Nobody has marked the spaces on the curb. So if you're having a big party and a lot of people are coming, the first person will park in just any old place. The next person will park in just any old place. And eventually more cars will come and fill in and fill in. If you park the cars randomly along a long straight curb, okay, um, it won't completely fill up because there will be spaces too small for a car. What's the maximum fill factor you can get if the drivers truly park randomly? I don't remember what it is for a straight line. We can do the same thing for pennies on the table. So imagine I take a coin, all coins the same size, and I take a coin and I just put it in a random spot on the table. Boom. Okay? And I take another coin and I put it randomly on the table. Boom. Did it, did it hit the first coin? Did it touch the first coin? If the answer is yes, I take it off and try it again. If the answer is no, I leave it there. And another coin, another coin, put them randomly until I try a million times. I can't get one more coin on there. That is random sequential absorption. And as it happens in two dimensions, the maximum fill factor from randomly putting things is uh, just under 55% of the area will be covered. 
That is a method for creating a random structure. It's kind of liquid-like. It has only short range order. It can't crystallize, right? Because there's no reorganization. Once the coin goes down, it never moves. It's not like you shake it up. OK, so that is a technique for creating a random mesh, I mean, a random set of points. And then you can triangulate those to make a mesh. It's just one possible algorithm. It's the one I chose. Now you can do it on a sphere, OK? So imagine having, well, it's kind of hard to glue a coin to a sphere because the sphere is round and the point is flat. If you had very small coins, you could glue them to a sphere. You could also think about little spheres attached to a big sphere. Like you just coat, coat the surface of the big sphere in little spheres. So let's see, who has little spheres? I know, donuts. Who likes to eat donuts? Do you ever get your donuts with sprinkles on them? Sometimes the sprinkles are long and skinny. I'm not talking about those, although we could in a minute. Let's talk about the little round sprinkles. Do those have a name? The long ones are called jimmies. I don't know what the little ones are called. They look like, I don't know, usually they're different colors. So imagine taking a big sphere and coating it in little spheres, okay? And then at random, again, putting one at a time until it's completely full and you can't put any more. Then at the center of each of those spheres, we put a, a mesh site and we put an XY spin. So here's a picture of an XY model on a sphere. Okay, so if we start with the spins on the sphere randomly oriented and quench it using Monte Carlo or any other method, it will form initially some defects. Well, all the, if, we, if we anneal really slowly on a flat plane, all the defects will go away. But if on a sphere, they don't. Okay, so let's talk about the gauss binet theorem. How many people we've been, have we talked much about this already, gauss binet theorem? Okay, coconuts, coconuts. Coconuts have hair. People have hair. Coconuts have hair in a different way than people have hair because we only have hair on the top of our heads. Okay, but if you look on the top of your head, you might find a place where all the hair goes out. Okay, so the coconut has on the top a place where all the hair kind of goes out, on the bottom a place where all the hair goes in. Two special points on the coconut. Can you comb the hair on a coconut so that there are no special points? Okay, you can't really comb a coconut, but maybe you can have, you know, a stuffed animal. What was that great uh, uh, Star Trek, my favorite, the old-fashioned Star Trek with Captain Kirk? You guys know that show? Do you remember the, there was a, uh, an episode, a famous episode called The Trouble with Tribbles? And the Tribble was an imaginary little creature that is furry and round. So imagine combing the hair on a Tribble. So it's just basically a spherical animal with hair. Combing the hair on a Tribble, can you comb the hair so that there's no special points? Well, you can comb it just like that with a special point at the top and a special point at the bottom. What if you comb the hair going sort of east everywhere around the globe on the triple? You would still have a special point at the top and a special point at the bottom. There's really no way to get around it. You have to have two special points. Actually, you can have one. How? You can bring them together? Yeah. And then you can have a plus two. Yes. I okay. I'm not sure what that would look like for hair. What would that look like? Oh, I guess it's, you uh, have to take the two of them together. Yeah, it's, uh, I don't know what they call it. Um, well, all the hair goes out of one and into the other. It's called, uh, it has a name. Well, I, I suggest at uh, Yvonne's uh, suggestion, I found the mm -hmm. Knox shop, the place, it's a hair cutting salon or hair salon in the student center. I think we should go there and challenge them. <laughs> Those pictures you had of the hair tied different ways, is that from there? Yeah, uh, it's not from there, but uh, I also was surprised to find the uh, barber shop called Knots, right? <laughs> it does seem counterintuitive. <laughs> I don't want to go to a place where they're so, going to tie my hair in knots. Uh, and, then, and then I googled and found lots of uh, styles involving knots, which is, I think, quite interesting. As a child, I learned the art of macrame. Have you heard of macrame? It is the art of tying cords to make decorative items. So a t the typical thing you would find is a, a plant hanger with little fibrils coming down, twisting and twisting and twisting. And actually from learning how to make that thing, I learned everything I need to know about chirality and chiral symmetry breaking. Because there's a knot in macrame. If you tie it right-handed, 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 you get a right-handed helix. Left-handed, 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 you get a left-handed helix. And if you go right, left, right, left, right, left, it's straight with no helicity. Ah, but if you go right, right, left, right, right, left, 
you get a longer pitch. You get a right-handed thing, but with a longer pitch. So I learned all about chirality from that. All that stuff about knots. Okay, so let's see what this actually looks like. It's got to be an arrow here somewhere. Here it is. It looks like a weather pattern, doesn't it? The director's moving around. So let's see what it looks like. Okay, so here's the random mesh with about 57%, or maybe not quite 57%, whatever that number was. So that's our random mesh. Um, defects form, can you tell the, the topological sign of these things? I think that's a plus one, a plus one and a minus one. And after the thing is fully annealed and all the defect perannihilation is finished, there's exactly two defects left. One you can see here, that's a plus one. And the one on the back side is also a plus one. So all the arrows come out on one side and go in the other side. Okay, so an XY model on a rigid sphere. The sphere can't change shape. The defects can move, but the spins themselves can only rotate. They, can, they do not move over the surface of the sphere. They stay put. Okay, now here's an interesting thing. This XY model has a very peculiar feature. On a sphere, this XY model with this random mesh favors splay instead of bend. So what happens here is I set up this system initially to have, whoops. Oh, this is, this is an animated GIF. There it goes, it's not, a, it's not an ABI. Um, I set it up with all the spins going east, right? This were the North Pole. And as they relax, they actually relax themselves into a splay configuration instead of bend. So here, the question is why would, you know, in the XY model on a flat plane, the energy associated with the defect does not change if you add a constant to all the spins. Oh, that's a good reason to use, a good excuse to use the boogie board. Excuse me? Yeah? There's no critical density of those slopes about which, about which you see those defects? Uh, because I think if you have a low density of few... Oh, if you have holes, something interesting would happen. Right? So a hole represents a free boundary and a defect could annihilate on the boundary. It would totally change the topology of the system. Don't you think? Yeah. Yeah. And, and for instance, if you had, um, try to think, if you had regions where the density was low, the defects would go there because they would cost less energy, all kinds of interesting things. So now I need to find my boogie board again. Boogie board, boogie board, where are you hiding? There you are. I have to get out of the way here so it won't. So here's the question, why would, why would a splay configuration be lower in energy? Imagine for a moment you have a tall mountain. There's my tall mountain. And if I put the directors like this on the mountain, they're almost parallel, right? So the, the delta theta between each pair of spins going around the mountain is smaller than if they go around the mountain this way, right? If they go around the mountain this way, they subtend a total of 2 pi angle. In the limit of a cylinder, they could actually all be parallel going around the cylinder. And on a mountain, they subtend angle less than 2 pi going all the way around. So it's actually because of the finite spacing of this XY, of this mesh on the sphere, it turns out that the bend, even though we normally think of the XY model as uh, being kind of like a frank energy with all the K coefficients equal, it's not. Let's see, what do I need? PowerPoint. Okay, what if I put uh, fur or hair on a donut? That's a donut you don't want to eat. <laughs> don't eat the furry donut. But if you had hair on a donut, um, can you comb it without any defects? What's the, what's the hairy donut theory? You have a hairy coconut theory. You've got to have total topological charge plus two. What about a donut? Can you comb it so there are no special points? What do you think? Sure, why not? You could comb the hair going around, or going around the other way, or going into the hole, or coming out of the hole, or at some angle, but it's, there's, it's easy to comb the hair on a donut. How about a figure eight? What if you had a stuff, let's say your, uh, your nephew or your niece was turning eight years old and you wanted to get them a nice present, you could get them a toy, a stuffed, a stuffed animal toy in the shape of a figure eight. It's not really an animal, it's a stuffed number, but anyway, a, po a poofy figure eight, and it had hair on it, and you could comb it. Can you comb it without any special points? 
the eight? No, you're gonna get two minus one defects and they're gonna preferentially locally, localize themselves on the hips of the eight. Okay, so there's a rule here, what is the rule? The Gauss-Binet theorem tells us that the total number of, the total topological charge for say a vector field on the body is two you're minus, I'm not projecting, I'm not projecting. Boogie board, boogie board, where did you go? There you are. Two minus two G, where G is the number of handles. Is that right, Mark? Yeah. Not holes, but handles. <laughs> okay. So a sphere has no handles, so G is zero. So the total topological charge is two. A donut has one handle. G is one, two minus two G is zero. The figure eight, the poofy figure eight, has two uh -huh. handles. Genus is two, G is two. Two minus two G is minus two. So you get minus two topological charge for the figure eight. That tells us the total topological charge that must be present for the vector field on the surface of that body. Okay, so plus two for a sphere, zero for a donut, also known as a torus, minus two for the figure eight. And I don't know what you would do for, I mean, you can have any number of handles, right? Um, but just because the total topological charge is two on the sphere doesn't mean you can only have two defects. In this picture, you can see the more defects are there than two, there's three. And those are only some, there's more on the other side. If the total topological charge is plus two, we've got a plus one, a plus one, and a minus one, there better be at least one other plus one. In fact, you can have as many plus minus pairs as you want and still satisfy the gauss binet theorem. Okay, so the gauss binet theorem only tells you the total charge. It doesn't tell you exactly how many defects there are. Okay, so let's look at this donut. So here's my hairy donut. So it's, it's a donut with an XY model on it. Okay, and here's what's really interesting. I annealed it as slowly as I could, and I could not get rid of all the defects. Okay, and here's why. The plus one defects migrate to the outer surface where the Gaussian curvature is positive, okay? And the minus defects migrate to the inner surface of the donut where the Gaussian curvature is negative, okay? And so even though there's an attractive interaction between the positive and negative defects, it's hard for them to annihilate because the plus defects like to stay on the outer region, the minus defects like to stay on the inner region. And it's like if a bird fell in love with a fish, where would they live, right? It's hard for these defects to pair annihilate because they get stuck in different regions of the material. So what can we learn from this, from this simple simulation model? We learn that curvature, I think I have another slide. We learn that curvature acts as an external potential for topological defects, right? So the defects of a certain sign like a certain curvature so positive defects tend to migrate to regions of positive curvature. Negative defects migrate to regions of negative curvature. Okay, it's not that I included another term in my Hamiltonian, it's just the XY Hamiltonian. What's interesting about this model is that um, the XY model was originally written for a flat plane, right? So when you take the dot product between two vectors, it's a dot product in the single, everything's just in one plane. But here, neighboring vectors live in three-dimensional space, right? They're still tangent, locally tangent to the plane of the object they're on, but they could be pointing in different directions. They're not necessarily, um, you know, all the spins are not coplanar. And there's something special about this particular type of interaction. Jonathan, did you want to say something about, like, intrinsic, extrinsic? Uh, I don't have any slides about that. But that's interesting about this particular system. Um, Okay, here's a picture of, of a particularly skinny donut. Okay, and you can see, I'm sorry, the, the, little, the little spins are kind of hard to see, so the big green arrows are just showing you the local general direction of the XY spins. There's a plus defect here and a minus defect there. Like the bird and the fish staring longingly at each other across the divide, they can't pair annihilate. And there's another plus one and another minus one pair there. Okay, so here, Everything is going, let's see, when is that, clockwise? Here it's going counterclockwise. So 
this plus minus pair and this plus minus pair represent a kind of a grain boundary between clockwise and counterclockwise domains. What that means is on a skinny torus, you can't just have, even though the total topological charge is, is zero, you can't just have one pair. Because if you had one pair, you'd have clockwise on this side and counterclockwise on that side. And what would they do when they meet, right? You have to have at least two boundaries. So that means the minimum number of topological charges that can occur on the donut is four. So it's not just that the gas bonnet theorem tells you that it has to be two. We know that the total number of defects that arise on the system is a multiple of four. Okay, and that might actually change the nature of the costulous thallus phase transition. I'm not even sure. Okay, if the torus is fat, and uh, we always like to get uh, um, donuts or bagels that look like that, right, with a small hole, because you get more food, it makes it tastier. But if it's, um, if it's not a very skinny torus, even the ground state might still have topological defects. It might be impossible to get rid of them entirely. Okay, how about an egg crate? An egg crate. The egg crate, this is a very simple shape. This is sine kx, sine ky. Up, down, up, down, up, down. Okay, put an xy model on that surface. Where do the defects go? What do you think? Okay, you can get a plus defect at the top of every mountain, at the bottom of every hole. Where's Lisa? Could that happen? Maybe something like that for your diatoms, right? Maybe. I mean, you're looking at a bulk phase and not something that's just on the surface. Oh, but wait, you have homeotropic boundary conditions. Yeah. You won't do that. Okay. <laughs> but, um, and then a minus defect at every saddle point. So the net topological charge is zero. This is just a flat plane. There's no particular reason. It's not, if it's a flat plane with periodic boundary conditions, it's not going to have uh, a net topological charge. It'll be zero. But you get plus one on the top, plus one on the bottom, and a minus one in every saddle. So they add up to zero. But if the mesh is fine enough, you can actually get a defect-free structure. Um, so that you don't have to have defects. They're not required by the topology. Okay. So the XY model is, is just a, a statistical physics model. Um, if you want to model an amatic liquid crystal and you don't want to go to the trouble to, to solve the, frank, the whole Frank free energy, have you guys have seen the Frank free energy before? Has anybody put it up yet? I don't think, okay, so we have splay, twist, and bend terms. Minimizing this thing is complicated. You get in trouble if you try to use a director field, so we use the QIJ tensor, and solving that is a little bit complicated. If you want to do something that's simpler, a simpler thing to do is the thing called the label Lasher model, which looks very much like the XY model. So we you know, define a, a director at each side on some lattice. We say the energy goes like the dot product square of any pair uh, you know, of, of neighbor interactions. So that means if they're parallel, the energy is low. It also means if they're anti-parallel, the energy is low. The highest energy is when they're perpendicular. Okay. Um, now, if you take the label Lasher model and confine the director to the xy plane, then you have a kind of a generalized xy model. Looks just like the regular xy model, except the arrows have no heads. Right. So it's just a, a simpler version. And so instead of having an energy that goes like you know, spin dot spin, you have to spin dot spin square. Generalized x, y model. And what happens when you put that thing on a sphere using a random mesh? Total topological charge still has to be one. I mean, excuse me, it has to be two on a sphere. Still has to be two. Okay, so for the x, y model on a sphere, we have two defects of charge plus one each, right? Now we have something kind of like a pneumatic. It's like a generalized xy model. And now the defects are not plus 1 and minus 1, but they can be plus 1 half or minus 1 half. What, what is this defect here, or what is this defect here? Those are plus 1 half. How can you tell? Right? You can rotate your pen around that thing and see it goes around pi, not too pi. Okay, what I've done here is I marked the sites that have high energy density. These Three spins mark one, I mean, those three green dots just mark a single defect. It's not three defects, it's just one. Okay, so it's a little bit of a distributed core. And this is the baseball texture that you see here from this wonderful paper by Vitaly and Nelson. Um, and in this particular configuration, 
those, uh, there's four defects total. You can only see two of them on the front of the thing. On the back, there's two more. They actually make a nice tetrahedron. Okay? But they don't have to make a tetrahedron. And Mark, are you going to be telling about this later in the week? Because I have a picture from one of your papers. <coughs> if you put a pneumatic on a sphere, so for, this was a simulation of rods on a sphere, right? This is Tom and Shin's work with Mark um, and Sean Zing. Uh, he used to be at Syracuse and is now in uh, Shanghai. Um, so these are, I don't know if you can see in the picture, these are actual rods on the sphere, right? So you start with a big sphere and then you like shrink it down until they were nice and dense. And there were four defects of charge plus one half each, but they didn't go in a tetrahedron. They actually went in a great circle. And you can see that here in this picture, defects number one, two, three, and four. These two are in the front, these two that are a little bit harder to see are in the back. Okay, so sometimes the defects don't organize themselves in a tetrahedron. And Mark, as I understand it, what you demonstrated was that um, where they actually go depends on the ratio of the uh, Frank constants for bend and splay, right? So which, which limit is it that puts them in the great circle? Pure splay or pure bend. Either way? Yeah. Okay. And if they're equal? Then you get the tetrahedron, and they can be anywhere in between. Yeah. And um, next week, uh, in, uh, in Christina's Marchetti's lecture, she also an active realization of this from Zonia uh, Dodgic and uh, Andreas Bausch, and that, so that's an active pneumatic. On, on a vesicle. And they swim, I guess they swim around and around. No, the system makes a, a clock, so it, it periodically oscillates between the tetrahedron and the planar configuration, and then through to inverted tetrahedron and back. So it's a natural oscillator. And, uh, so it's, uh, both those ground states appear in this in the active pneumatics. That's hilarious. Yeah. Okay, and just to give you another example, uh, I want to talk about something completely different, striped phases. So we talked about Ising models before. Um, have you ever heard the word lattice gas to describe the Ising model? So usually when we talk about the Ising model, we think of an upspin and a downspin representing magnetic states. But you could also imagine them representing, say, a binary alloy where an upstate is one chemical species, a downstate is a difficult, different chemical species, and they can be miscible at high temperature and unmixed at low temperature. Okay, so we're going to use a lattice gas model. So this SISJ uh, represents states of different sites. So if we set J negative, then particles of the same type like to cluster together. But if we set J positive, the system's anti-ferromagnetic. And in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to let J be anti-ferromagnetic and have long-range interactions out to, the, out to like five neighbors away. So the best analogy for this, and excuse me for heteronormative language, but imagine you're at a party where there are both uh, heterosexual men and heterosexual women. And every man wants to be surrounded by women out to a distance of five. And every woman wants to be surrounded by men out to a distance of five. How would they pattern themselves? This is a very simple model for pattern formation. Okay. And we're going to run this uh, simulation in the geometry where there are 50% uh, of one species and 50% of the other species and see what happens. And the answer is they make stripes. Okay, what happens when you put stripes on a curved surface? If I put it on flat surface, I would just get parallel stripes. And they would choose randomly between east, west, north, south, maybe some diagonal thing. But if you put it on a curved surface, how do you make stripes? So to put stripes on a sphere, you have two choices. You can make rings, or you can make a spiral, right? The spiral, this particular one made a spiral. On the donut, you can make stripes that just continuously wind through the sample with no defects. Um, here's another torus where you can see a defect, right? Does that remind you of the, the, the stripes in the cholesteric structure. Okay, here they are on some cylinders. So, for instance, you can see another defect here. So there's a there's a special distance 
you know, I made that cutoff at distance 5 that specifies the preferred stripe width of 5. And if that's not commensurate with 2 pi r around the thing, it'll just put the stripes at some angle. And here you can see this one's not completely annealed. So these are really, really trivially simple models to code, and they produce complex structures. And so I think it's, it's fun to play with topological defects in, in curved geometries. You can study stripe systems, too. For the wide stripe cylinder, why does that defect be Why is for this one? Yeah. Uh, it could be because it's incompletely annealed. It could be because Let's see, the angle's a little bit different here than it is here, and maybe that's how it, 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 it's just been completely annealed, or annealed too quickly. Um, it also might be that no matter, for this particular size, no matter how carefully I anneal it, I might have never be able to get rid of the defect. It could just purely be a consequence of the incommensurate lengths of the characteristic stripe within the circumference of the object. I don't know, it's a topology question. Uh, if, does, there, does there exist? So the thing is, if the stripes are completely vertical, okay, if the, if the circumference is not a product of the natural length, it will organize itself. Um, if you try to do a simulation of a symmetric liquid crystal in a box with fixed geometry, you may discover, for instance, that uh, the, the size of your box is, say, five and a half times your natural spacing, and that will cause the layers to form at an angle or it may actually suppress layer formation. So geometry and topology can interact in, in complex ways. So I gave myself a note here to stop. So next time we're going to talk about defects in tilted membranes, a little bit um, more connected to experiment. And then the last thing I'm going to talk about uh, in the fourth lecture is about defects in pneumatic elastomers. But anyway, today I left myself five minutes for questions. I know you guys are probably hungry. But if there's something on your mind, please ask. Thank you. For the questions for uh, for uh, further questions. I think it's time for lunch. Time for lunch. Yeah, I'm right. hungry. Well, we will take a break and we will reconvene.